Yo, what up? Welcome to another episode of the Oakland Warriors podcast. I'm Patrick, and I am here with Aram in Toronto. What up, Aram? <laughs> Not much. <laughs> I am here in Toronto still. Yeah, how's the weather? It's hot. It's been hot. Hot, kind of like all this, uh, your favorite Ben Simmons chatter. It's so much Ben Simmons chatter. We've really reached the point of nothing is happening. So let's just throw some Ben Simmons stuff out there just to get that uh, NBA Twitter turning a little bit some more. I, I don't know. I mean, <laughs> how many times have we talked about Ben Simmons uh, in the last in the last few episodes? Like um, way too many times. Way I... too many times. And uh, I appreciated Anthony Slater's article in The Athletic. It's just like, okay, people just, it's not happening. It may happen it, you never know it could happen but right now nothing's happening so just stop <laughs> you know yeah, yeah. Uh, so i i appreciated that i imagine i imagine he's sitting there and he just sees all this stuff if i were him i would just be like man all these people just kind of regurgitating and spinning like making stuff up he mu- like it must feel good for him just to be like no <laughs> okay <laughs> no <laughs> totally totally like you're hearing people like us speculating on well, how how can we uh, manipulate the cap so we can fit them under and uh, and then and then somebody who's connected actually saying hearing like you know people nothing's happening right now on on that ben simmons note like i just want to see how many times you could say the name ben simmons but you had an interesting idea in honor of ben ben simmons well, it is fascinating. It's part of why people are talking about it because it's this like NBA drama, NBA meltdown. And uh, I know when we were talking before, it's kind of like, what does this remind you of? Doesn't this seem like a really Warriors situation? And, and I'm talking like Warriors past, past, past. Although, you know, definitely people are rehashing the KD and Draymond thing. Um, but But this Ben Simmons situation of a player wanting out, sending uh, missives through agents and uh, and leaks, and you have uh, a strong front office trying to do their best to recoup the value from that. That all sounds uh, very familiar. Um, so I think it would be really fun to talk about, uh, maybe not our favorite, but our most infamous uh, Warriors meltdowns from the past. Yeah, man. My Warriors fandom is littered with pain and suffering. So yeah, it might not be fun, but I'm I'm all for it. Pre-dynasty, pre-Steph, this is this is the this is the only thing that ever got the Warriors in the news. <laughs> is uh, you know, uh, all-star so and so traded from Warriors <laughs> for three second round picks, you know? Let me uh, you know, steal myself a little bit, make sure that I'm I have the stomach for this, but I um, know. It's a, it's a if we're we're going back to a painful past. So, um take all the time you need to get to get ready, all right? So <laughs> <laughs> so, dead air. <laughs> so, we might as well start with the biggest the big one. Warriors meltdown of of our uh, lifetimes, which is the Chris Weber, Chris Weber meltdown, the meltdown. Uh, can you recount what you can remember of that? Like what was the loose chronology of it? Yeah. And when I say Chris Weber meltdown, it wasn't like him per se melting down, yeah. just the situation falling apart. So Chris Weber was the number one pick in 1993 and he was picked by the Orlando magic who somehow got back to back number one picks And we traded Penny Hardaway out of Memphis State at the time, called Memphis State, and three future firsts to Orlando for Chris Webber. And it was totally worth it because the Warriors had just come off of those run TMC years. They had traded uh, Mitch Richmond for Billy Owens. And, you know, dubious decision, (laughs) which we could talk about another time, deserves this whole other episode. Yeah. But- Weber was awesome. He was rookie of the year. He was like exactly what they needed. He was a futuristic power forward who could Mm -hmm. handle the ball, who could shoot it a little bit and yeah, was athletic and a star like from the get go. He, he, he was already a star. Yes. Yes. Uh, For a team that was like, kind of had, you know, second tier stars more or less like 
sure Chris Mullen was on the dream team and everybody knew run TMC, but it just wasn't like at that top level. So it was awesome. It was, you know, my uh, childhood basketball utopia. And then it all kind of fell apart, right? The next season, he and Don Nelson had a rift, uh, which could not be mended. And fast forward, basically, the Warriors and Chris Cohan sided with Don Nelson. They trade Chris Weber for Tom Gugliotta, three picks. And then that all fell apart because, you know, Spreewell was on the team at that point and he just iced out Tom Gugliotta. <laughs> and that didn't work. Who was and not then, a bad player, but he was bad on the Warriors. He though. played well for Minnesota when, yeah. when he got traded to them. But uh, it just started the whole series of failures and not even starts and stops, just constant stops. After that, the Warriors focused so much on uh, quote unquote, good character guys yeah. and they would draft people like Todd Fuller and Donald Foyle over Kobe Bryant and Trace McGrady. Yeah, it was just a a, a terrible terrible uh time to be a Warriors fan and it all started with the Chris Webber Don Nelson feud I suppose. Also, Tim Hardaway had tore his ACL yep. and yep. didn't play Webber's rookie year, yep. right? So, he wasn't there. Avery Johnson played admirably, but then when Hardaway came back, Webber couldn't take all this shit. They didn't get along. And then that was another breaking point. You know, they talk so much now about team culture and fit and development and all these kinds of things. And clearly not every team cultivates a a positive culture, but there is more talk about it being essential to a successful organization. And uh, uh, it's very clear that none of that was happening back then. And I think, you know, that's part of how, um, coaching has changed. That's how organizational philosophies have changed over time, because all of this sh- stuff could have been avoided, you know. But you had very strong players, uh, uh, very strong personalities. You had a recluse owner who had just taken over the team uh, in 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 the preceding years, who was also like a, and he had done it kind of in a dodgy way. Um, he kind of did a little uh, end around or cloak and dagger maneuver to get the team. And Don Nelson is pretty shifty himself and also not good with young, young, young players. Right. You know, I think so, you know, we're not here to assign blame. Uh, we're here <laughs> to talk about how disappointing it was because that team was so exciting. That team was lit. The Bay area was so excited for that. I mean, that, was it like you said a dream scenario how many years had they been going through stiff after stiff big man trying to find somebody to pair with these uh really talented perimeter scoring options and like and then here was this guy who was a star everybody knew him he could score he could rebound he could pass he could run the floor um he had a thousand watt smile um he had everything it was just it was just perfect and absolutely worth all the capital that they traded for him. I remember I didn't have cable, but I watched that draft. I was at my grandma's house and I, and I watched that like happening. And, you know, I wasn't like any like draft draft head back then. Um, but I knew who Chris Weber was like, I watched him play. Right. And when that trade happened, it was, uh, it was new nerf hoop all summer, you know, <laughs> with, with that team, you know, um, just Weber dunking on people. So I was so, so excited. So this is by far, at least in, in my warriors, uh, my warriors history, this is, this is the meltdown of all meltdowns, uh, especially cause it could have been avoided, you know, uh, from all sides, like Nelson didn't know a good thing when he saw it. Uh, when he had it uh, and Weber, you know, young and headstrong didn't want to play center, but he could have really revolutionized a smaller ball player. Right. Right. Yeah. Yeah. And and then, and then it's also like, how much do you value your friends? <laughs> right. Cause that was another part of the rift was like, it's like, okay, you don't want to play center or at least this is the story at this time at the time. Okay. You don't want to play center. Well, let's trade Billy Owens for Ronnie Cycli, Right. And that was just another, you know, log on the dumpster fire, right? 
um, to mix my metaphors. Um, uh, <laughs> who, who throws logs on a dumpster fire? Um, but uh, but oh, you traded my best friend. I want out. You know, like that was that that didn't help. I don't think that was the the catalyst for everything. So. I'm a little bit older than you, and I was a big draft head back then, and I knew exactly who Chris Weber was out of like what is a Detroit Country Day School. Like I had been reading about him for a couple years when he was still in high school, and obviously Fab Five, all that good stuff, and like this marquee spotlight, like you're saying, it was all of a sudden on the Warriors and him playing center. Look at the NBA right now, and know obviously like what Don Nelson, his kind of weird visionary type of offenses that would have revolutionized the game, right? He would have been for the listeners who didn't see Weber play uh, for younger folks, he would be, he would have been Jokic more Nikola Jokic, more athletic and a little less funky. But, but can you imagine like if Jokic would dunk, dunk on people that was basically what he was the 93 playoffs i think it was game five that they lost uh to phoenix that was the game where weber did the fast break behind the back dunk <laughs> on barkley where barkley fell backwards i think that was the game i was at that game oh yeah <laughs> and it was crazy because everyone was standing the whole damn game Right. And like, I'm this like short kid. I'm just like, this sucks. <laughs> <You know? laughs> but no, I mean, I could see enough and it was, it was crazy. Like the electricity was something at that age I'd never seen because, you know, most of the games and most of the teams were mediocre. And I like to think, I mean, this is kind of turning into a bit of a what if, but I will always maintain that this team of that could have been Tim Hardaway. Latrell Sprewell, Chris Mullen, Chris Weber, and Ronnie Cycli, or Billy Owens, and, and or Chris whoever, Weber. <laughs> right? <laughs> whoever that fifth person like, is, yeah. That that team, as much as I love Mitch Richmond, like that team with Sprewell, that that dude was a bad man. You know, the guy yep. was super athletic. Yep. Uh, he was fearless, and they had a combination of athleticism, shooting. They had some really, really good pieces around them. And I, I swear, like this might sound like extreme homerism, but that team, especially in the years that Jordan was playing baseball, and you know, those were the years that the Suns and Elijah Wan's Rockets, that's when you know the Rockets won back to back titles. I'm not saying the Warriors would have won the title, but they would have been top three in the Western Conference. They would have had a shot, I think. Yeah, I think yeah. that that yeah. roster back then, top to bottom, that starting lineup would have been awesome. You know, yeah. to me, like a lot of it falls to Don Nelson, and I don't think he's gotten enough crap for his part in it. And you know, part of it is the glow of the We Believe team. You know, whatever, fifteen years later, but the fact that he played such a huge role in it. Um, makes me really mad at him. You know what I mean? <laughs> like he's this kind of like lovable icon, but he messed it up, you know? Yeah. I mean, he was a total jerk about that. He was like the old guy who should have known better, but he was yeah. egotistical. And this whole thing about like afterwards when they were trying to draft like for good character. I mean, obviously there's racial undertones with all that stuff, right? Yep. Especially back then. I mean, especially anytime. And the thing is like, Weber got all the hate and then Nelson leaves right mm -hmm. <laughs> soon after Weber leaves and he gets to rewrite his own story mm -hmm. in Dallas with Dirk, yeah. with Nash, with Finley, you know, and then he comes yeah. back, the We Believe team, et cetera. And that's all fine and dandy. But that period, <laughs> Don Nelson ruined. <laughs> he did. He ruined 90s. the franchise. I mean, <laughs> and a lot of people had their hand in that, in, in ruining it as well, but he played a major role. and and coaches did not have the accountability that they do now. And, you know, people talk about like, it, it's, it's a player's league and, um, and you know, the ramifications of that. Uh, but this was an example of a coach having too much, <laughs> too much yeah. influence. Cause he was GM too, right? You know, it makes sense. He came up in the red Auerbach system, right? Where Auerbach was the, you know, mm -hmm. oversaw everything. So he, that's the model and the context that he, was working from. 
right? Yeah. Um, so, you know, this kind of NBA tree of history, you know, it's just uh, all, all the roots and tentacles and, and what and whatnot. Yeah. I mean, that, that was, that was brutal, man. Cause I was in, I think I was in college when they traded Weber, the Warriors started out like seven and one with Spreewell and Hardaway. And they're trying to spin this as Spreewell and Hardaway. Yeah. Uh, that's who their leaders of this team were. And then they just tanked and they won like a handful of games after that. They get rid of Hardaway for Bimbo Coles and um, uh, some other chump change. And then Hardaway says, Bimbo Coles couldn't hold my jock, which is still one of the greatest uh, <laughs> quotes I've ever heard in my life. And, and uh, indisputable as well. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, he, he went on to, you know, I, I think people thought, oh, he, he's washed, right? Like he tore his knee. He's not going to be good anymore. And sure, he wasn't as athletic anymore, but he became a much better shooter. Um, what, do you, what do you make, like two or three all more all-star games with the Heat? Yeah, and with the Heat. Like he, he was good. He was like number five or five, six, seven in MVP voting one year, which isn't you know great, but like still at the time I was like, still oh, pretty great. damn good. Yeah, and we you know that is better than Bimbo Coles. <laughs> yeah. Hey, week one of the NFL season is over, and the San Francisco 49ers are one and zero. Oh. How about them apples? But the season's just getting started at DraftKings Sportsbook, an official sports betting partner of the NFL. To kick off week two, DraftKings has given new customers 200 bucks in free bets instantly when they bet $1 on any football game. Head to the DraftKings Sportsbook app now and place a bet of $1 on any week two game to receive $200 in free bets instantly. If Sportsbook is not yet available in your state, DraftKings still has huge cash prizes up for grabs all season long with their daily fantasy contests. DraftKings has given all new customers a free shot at millions of dollars in total prizes with their first deposit. Download the DraftKings Sportsbook app now and use promo code TBPN to receive $200 in free bets when you place a $1 bet on any football game. That's promo code TBPN this week at DraftKings Sportsbook, an official sports betting partner of the NFL. Must be 21 or older, New Jersey, Indiana, or Pennsylvania only, new customers only, minimum $5 deposit and $1 wager required, one per customer, restrictions apply. See DraftKings.com sportsbook for details. Gambling problem? Call 1-800-GAMBLER or in Indiana, 1-800-9-WITH-IT. So you mentioned Spreewell. I mean, this is the kind of trajectory. The Weber was the start of the, the meltdown and the legacy continued with Spreewell. So um, like you were saying, they put a priority on, well, they had coaching changes. They put a priority on character, um, uh, but they sucked, right? And then, uh, so this is what I remember. I think it was uh, the 97 season. Um, I remember that because that was my first year in college. They had hired PJ Carlissimo, who had success in college prior. Um, and I think that was their no more Mr. Nice Guys uh, marketing campaign. Yeah, him and Gary uh, St. Jean. Yeah, and uh, and they they had, uh, it was kind of like a men in black look to the yeah. commercial and they wore sunglasses. <laughs> it was brutal. Man, it's so um, wonky. Yeah. It was so bad. Uh, and so by then they would have had Todd Fuller on the roster um, they would have <laughs> just had drafted a Donald Foyle, like you said. And at this point, Spreewell was definitely one of the top five two guards in the NBA. Yeah, he made but, a couple all-star teams. Yeah, yeah. And uh Starting. And, then, and and early in the in the season, it, it already hadn't been going well. And uh and in a practice, I guess Spreewell was dogging it a little bit, and PJ Colosimo said, Hey, put a little mustard on that pass. And uh and then Spreewell lost it. And choked PJ Carlissimo, and uh, <laughs> and I think, and I and, and I remember seeing on the news they showed the scars on his uh, or like the scratches on his neck. Right. Um, he was not happy in the situation, <laughs> uh, needless to say. So uh, we would have had Joe Smith on that team as well. I think. Um, another, yeah. yeah. Oh man. Yeah. That's another draft pick that. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> um, anyway. Um, and then, and then of course we end up trading uh, Spreewell for John Starks, former warrior, John Starks, 
um, very old Terry Cummings, end of the line Terry Cummings, um, and Chris Mills uh, yep. to from the New York Knicks. And then, of course, Spearwood goes to the Knicks in the 98-99 season. The Knicks made the made the finals with yeah. Sprewell and Mar- Marcus Camby, I think. Mm-hmm. Um, old Larry Johnson or uh, Larry Johnson with a broken back, and and of course we we went on to more misery. So <laughs> so I I think I mean there even though this is like the number two meltdown, this is definitely the sequel of the meltdowns. Yeah, I mean it, it, to see all the connective tissue in the nineties for all these cause and effect moves, it's really, really absurd to see how, uh, how, how bad it really was. I mean, bottom feeder teams, like I, I, I empathize with a lot of Timberwolves fans. Sometimes I read some of their comments and blogs and, and articles and tweets. And I was like, Oh yeah, I remember what this is like, you know, Mm -hmm. and it keeps you, uh, it keeps you grounded. (laughs) It was a terrible time to be a Warriors fan, man, because like, I, I recall, because remember, Don Nelson found John Starks out of the CBA, mm-hmm. you know, Continental Basketball Association back then. And he played for the Warriors for like part of a season and then he signed with the Knicks. And then he got free reign to jack up a bunch of shots. And I remember like this is when <laughs> I first really, really understood the New York East Coast bias uh, media hype cycle because like everybody I knew was like, Oh man, John Starks, he's so good. I mean, everybody I knew who was like from the East Coast uh, in my college years was like, oh yeah, he's so good. And man, like, oh, Spreewell, blah, blah, blah. I was like, do you guys realize how good Spreewell is? <laughs> and John Starks is only famous because he plays Madison Square Garden. Yeah. Yeah. And then he comes to the Warriors and you realize, oh yeah, he is not good. And like, that was so frustrating to me to see like all these people from New York and New Jersey talk about how like a uh, good uh john starks is it's like if he's so good would they you know would he come with two other players you know what i mean yeah and chris mills i liked you know terry cummings i liked too and they played well and they were competitive to some extent but there was such a low ceiling for that team and that was the team that i think had mugsy (laughs) <laughs> Muggsy Bogues yeah, I mean, on you, it. You, you had all the- Mookie Blaylock. You, yeah, all, you had all the-, the Retreads. The, the retreads, yeah. You had, uh, I mean, there was like BJ Armstrong, Bimbo Coles, Jason Mark Caffey. Price, like all these like, just, I mean, this is what bad teams do is, you know, they they chase, they chase, you know, uh, past performances and, right. and, and whatnot, right? Like, oh, BJ Armstrong was an all-star. Like, and 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 now we give him a big contract. I mean, I, I I was such a believer, or I wanted to believe so much that uh, I was like, oh, you know, and 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 I and actually, out of the three, I think Terry Cummings was almost like the biggest surprise because he was at the end of the line, but he was this old dude that could play, and he and I think he won them a couple of games, you know? Yeah. And I was, yeah, like I said, I was just such a believer. I, I wanted them to be okay, and they were kind of competitive. So I was like, oh, maybe the trade wasn't so bad. But, you know, deep it's down, terrible. It, it was a terrible trade, and it was a terrible situation. And, and that's what, you know, uh, to bring it back to Ben Simmons, I mean, that's what Philadelphia wants to avoid is to, like, or any team, is to trade to not trade away your, 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 your asset for pennies on the dollar, which is, that's what we got in that trade. So it's like, you're saying these, these, this nineties uh, timeline, uh, it, it definitely humbles you. And, and I think we've talked about it. It's traumatizing in that, <laughs> uh, I know that over the years when we've watched games, like simultaneously, we're just like, Oh man, here it comes. Like, <laughs> Oh man, here it comes! Like the collapse is is uh, is is upon us. You know what I mean? Because yeah. we've seen it before. We've seen the the collapse many we've times felt during it. our formative yeah. years, yes. right? Like yes. it's, it's like ingrained in us. One day I'm gonna like have a do a podcast with like a a longtime Lakers fan somewhere out there, and I want to talk about like the differences between like Lakers fans and Warriors fans and how they you know, kind of think yeah. about their teams. But yeah, exactly. I, I remember going to my friend's house <laughs> and just popping in and just turning on games 
and being like, wow, this might be the worst collection of players I've ever, <laughs> ever seen. And it just became a, a habit forming at that point. You know, you're like, well, oh, shrug your shoulders. Like this is going to be, this is going to be, uh, uh, this is going to be bad. And all the while, Chris Weber <laughs> is in Washington and then yeah. in SAC playing well, playing yeah. up to his pedigree and the yeah. hype and matching all that stuff. I will say one thing about the Chris Weber era. I was also at the game, the first game he came back where uh, he played for the wizard, uh, the bullets and he separated his shoulder, right? Like he on some um, fluke play, yeah. I think he landed funny and he separated or dislocated his shoulder and the crowd was going wild. And I was furious because I was on Weber's side. I was like so mad that they traded him yeah. and I was siding with him in this Don Nelson feud, which I think people my age who were knowledgeable would side with Weber, but then like older people would whatever, you know, side with Nelson. It felt like, I don't know. Well, to be honest, I have to admit, I think I was on the organization's side because uh. I think that the media really uh, made Weber out to be, oh, he doesn't want to play center. That's, you know, he just wants to play with his friends. And, and, and you know, the, the media was much like what you had exposure to and was much more narrow back then um, in terms of like, you, well, you could read the newspaper. And at the time I was probably just reading the San Francisco Chronicle. Right. Um, and watching a, a little bit of the news and then maybe, maybe the like warriors round table, you know what I mean? Which is all, those are all filtered through. It's all PR. Yeah, exactly. The team's PR. Yeah, no, I was a hundred percent on Weber's side. Uh, and when people booed, I just couldn't believe it. I mean, I could, but I was like so annoyed by it because it wasn't to me, you know, at the time it wasn't his fault that he got traded. At. Like it just yeah. seemed no, to me up. that it was like totally wrong. And and that stuff, I mean, we see it happen all, all the time. And, um, <laughs> you know, I'll bring that up later with another meltdown, but yeah, the, End of the 90s was probably the worst because it, like there was no hope. There was nothing in the past, in the recent past, and there's nothing in the present and nothing in the in the yeah. future, right? <laughs> yeah. Like the 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 they may have said no more Mr. Nice Guys, but they went with I mean the Joe Smith pick in 95, he was like player of the year, but I wanted Rasheed Wallace personally. And and taking someone like Todd Fuller instead of Kobe Bryant or anyone else in that 96 class. <laughs> yeah. So good, right? And and then taking a Donald Foyle over Trace McGrady, which which is like, hey, you know, taking these uh, high schoolers has turned out to be pretty good. Maybe we take this one. Oh, no, why don't we take this other guy who doesn't know how to play basketball, you know? Yeah. <laughs> but he's like 22 and not athletic, yeah. you know? That's rough. And then, and then eventually, you know, Spreewell became kind of a caricature of himself when he went to Minnesota and that whole yeah. thing with like, yeah. I need money to feed my family and all that jazz. But, uh, you know, he got the – helped get the Knicks to the finals in the year after Jordan retired, the lockout season. That, that, was, that was rough, man. And it was great – seeing Spreewell like rise up. I was so happy about the homegrown talent. Like this guy <laughs> who was like this unknown, relatively unknown third best player on his Alabama team, uh, Robert Ori and some other, somebody else I forgot. And all of a sudden became like the best out of all of them became an mm -hmm. all NBA player, first teamer at least once, I think. And then it all just, you know, fell apart from there. There was a time where it, and I think this is this happens a lot to fans of bad teams is that the sense that when your players go somewhere else, they get really good. And, and, and that seemed to happen all the time. Like so many people would move on and they, you know, be contributors on a winning team or all stars and, and whatnot. So um, those were definitely dark days. I think what it did was it twisted 
And like I was saying, you're always expecting the other shoe to drop because there was such a high, there was so much excitement and the team seemed to have so much potential and, and then it all came crashing down. That seems like a good place to stop. Be sure to tune in to part two of the worst Warriors meltdowns of our lifetimes. That'll be dropping later on this week. All right. That is another episode of the Oakland Warriors podcast. Be sure to subscribe wherever you get your podcast. You can also listen and watch the episodes on YouTube at youtube.com slash National Film Society. Hit me up on Twitter at Patrick Epino, E-P-I-N-O, or at Oakland Warriors. Hit up Aram and tell him how much you love his takes at Aram Collier, A-R-A-M-C-O-L-L-I-E-R. Check us out at OaklandWarriors.com and be sure to tell your fellow Warrior fan friends to tune in and listen. And if you're so inclined, leave us a five-star rating and say dope stuff about the show on Apple Podcasts. The Oakland Warriors Podcast is produced by National Film Society and is a part of the Basketball Podcast Network. That's it. Music in this episode provided by Paper Sun. Special thanks to Paul Amardo for production support. See you next time.